let's get started. So, hello everyone. Um, so welcome to the environmental research seminar. Uh, I am Song Gyun Park, a faculty member of epidemiology and uh, environmental health sciences. So this seminar series is sponsored by the Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease Center, MLEAD. So today I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Rebecca Patrock, um, also called Beck, uh, who is uh, our one of the center scientists this year. So Dr. Petrov is a lecturer and postdoctoral research fellow uh, here at University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Petrov holds a Master of Science and PhD in Environmental Health Toxicology from the University of Washington. Her research aims uh, to understand the links between early life exposures to chemical and social stressors, the epigenome and health effects later in life. Uh, so Dr. Petrov will talk about this interesting topic. So I will uh, hand over this and then uh, before he or uh, she starts. So if you have any question, please put your question to Q&A and then uh, after uh, Dr. Petrov's presentation, we will uh, follow up. So, yeah, we can start. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much um, for that kind introduction. I'm really honored to be here today um, talking to you about what I think is really fascinating and I hope all of you do too. Um, talking a little bit about environmental epigenetics and epidemiology and how we need to start to think about things maybe slightly differently. And I'm gonna use the example of PFAS which you can see here in this little Teflon cartoon pan and how this might relate to epigenetics and infant birth outcomes later on. Before we get started, I just wanted to take time to share the acknowledgement of the historical and present day colonization that is ongoing throughout North America. So I'm speaking to you as a current University of Michigan researcher whose work and home sits upon lands stolen from multiple nations of independent people, including the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, the Potawatomi, as long as, along with those that they share the land with, the Seneca, the Delaware, the Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations. With you today, I hope we can take a moment to first have gratitude for nearby waters and lands with which we are all interconnected and depend on to sustain our life and well-being. The people of the independent nations who came before us and live here still today have had connections with these lands for millennia, <clears throat> something that I think many of us colonizers often lose sight of. As an active step towards decolonization, I hope that you take the time after this presentation to learn more about the history of the land which you might be standing on. Um, one of my favorite resources is this site here, nativeland.ca. There's also, I included this self-reflection survey that you might be able to use to further this process and reflect on how your relationship um, interacts with indigeneity, oh my goodness, and um, our lands and all of the things that we share in this moment today. So thank you for taking that recognition. I also wanna make sure that I take time to share so that this research is funded by many important sources that have graciously contributed and a, a number of different important people have also contributed to this research. So funding comes from the School of Public Health, MLEAD as my center scientist grant. I really appreciate being a member and a trainee on, as part of this great program. And then we also have funding from NIEHS and EPA. I have a great group of co-authors who helped uh, me establish this whole paradigm of work that I'm going to be presenting on, including those from the Do Goods Pie Lab. And then there were several people along the way that were essential to sample collection and data processing to get this project where it is now. Finally, I want to thank all the participants who graciously gave their time and samples for this research. And then I want to excuse myself because I'm still getting over a cold. So I apologize for the coughing intermittently. <clears throat> so before I dive in, or to start our talk today, I'm really gonna talk about the epigenome. 
So as many of us all may know, the epigenome is the collection of chemical marks and different um, structural things that are going on in our cells that control how our genes are translated and transcribed into proteins and how we live and respond throughout our health and environment. The epigenome exists from the chromosome, which is a really large structure on which our DNA is stored, all the way down to single base pair changes and modifications at the DNA level, as shown here in this image. It's really important for our health and well being. There are a number of different developmental diseases that have been related to differences in the epigenome. One of the most compelling is that of um, Rett syndrome, which is a drastic neurodevelopmental disorder that can really impact a person's life and is entirely due to differences in the epigenome. The epigenome is also responsive to our environments. Um, so as we grow and age, it is changing to in response to things that we are exposed to, as well as just normal aging processes. And so as an environmental health scientist, this is incredibly interesting because the epigenome could hold key to understanding some of the relationship between some exposures and health outcomes down the line. In the world of environmental epigenetics and especially with a focus on environmental epidemiology, the most commonly studied mark is DNA methylation. Um, this is interesting because, of course, there's a lot of other parts of the epigenome that we're not really getting at, but there's a lot within just this DNA methylation mark that we need to consider. So this is where I'm going to spend most of the talk today. So in environmental epidemiology studies, the epigenome as we study it today, I think of as sort of like a single light bulb. We're interested in how one light bulb on a base pair resolution scale of C changes from off to on or from a methylation mark C plus something versus that just normal base of C. We typically use base-wide base -wise investigation to look at differences using arrays or individual gene-wise investigation with pyrosequencing or nanopore to look at that. But what this is really missing is the fact that the epigenome and even the marks on DNA methylation itself is not just one light bulb turning off and on, but many hundreds of thousands of light bulbs all operating together to contribute to how our genes turn off and on across different scenarios. So here's our cytosine residue on which the DNA methylation mark is typically made. And what we often think of for DNA methylation is this single mark of 5-methylcytosine. And this is important because canonically speaking, 5-methylcytosine has been thought of as something that turns off genes. Um, we know that the, there are subtle differences in that depending on where that occurs on the genome, but what's interesting is that there are a number of different marks that follow in this process of 5-methylation uh, uh, across the cytosine mark that contribute to gene expression in different ways. So while 5-methylcytosine is thought to typically turn things off, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, as shown here, can turn things the opposite direction. These other two marks down here are potentially also important, but they're found at much less uh, frequency than the marks up here. And so when we're thinking about environmental epigenetics and, and in, in epidemiology, we need to start to consider how this collection of light bulbs that include not just 5-methylcytosine, not just 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, but how all these things could be operating together compare across the entire genome. So in particular, as I was kind of suggesting on the left, left, last slide, 5-methylcytosine and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine seem to be some of the most important. Um, one way to look at this is just on frequency. So 5-methylcytosine over here on the left occurs kind of at this 1% with more or less, depending on which organ you're in. 5-hydroxymethylcytosine is typically at less 
than 5-methylcytosine, but still at a very significant level, especially when we consider organs like the brain, where it accounts for almost half of the total methylation marks on all cytosines in the brain tissue. Um, compared to those other two marks, 5-FC and 5-CAC, there's only about 20 and 3, respectively, um, molecules of those particular marks in the mouse embryo compared to 30,000 marks of 5-methylcytosine and 1,300 marks of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So it's these two intermediates at the very end occur at very, very low levels. Additionally, as we're learning more and more about 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, we're learning that it is a very stable mark, so it can continue to exist and contribute to gene expression and translation down the line, um, uh, which is not really thought to be the case for those 5-FC and 5-CAC. So thinking about, again, what's the most useful for environmental epidemiology, thinking about these two marks as not just one uh, total thing, but instead two contrasting things that do opposite effects is really important for understanding health effects down the line. All of this is particularly important when considering the prenatal exposome. So in prenatal scenarios, the epigenome is being rewritten and uh, translated into all of our different proteins and everything that we need to grow and develop as organisms. During this free writing process, it's incredibly sensitive to the environment, um, including normal stuff like just what the mom is eating during this time or if she gets any severe infections, but also what chemicals she is exposed to during this time, and what chemicals that the developing fetus is exposed to as well. And we think that all of these effects in how they impact the prenatal epigenome can have long-term effects in our health, but also serve as biomarkers, especially for toxic exposures. One of the most common chemicals that we are known to be exposed to today, and what I'm interested in talking about, is PFAS. And I think most of us probably have heard about this. I'm seeing it more and more in pop culture, which I'm really excited about because I think um, it's going to be an interesting time to study how PFAS exposures change. But <clears throat> to start off here, PFAS or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances are a really large class of chemicals with over 12,000 known entities. And the the chemical signature of these are that they are fluorinated carbon chains. So they're typically single length chains of varying lengths. Longer chains with more than eight carbons are kind of considered worse for health overall than shorter chain molecules. And they all have this fluorinated compound on them. And what that fluorinated compound does is it actually helps with all these chemical properties and why they're added to these consumer products over here. Um, they've been manufactured since the 1940s, and they're used to repel grease, water, um, stains, things like Scotchgard, Teflon. Those are all PFAS really derived chemicals that help us in our everyday lives. Um, some of the most famous ones, including PFOA and PFOS, have been really widely used and pretty well studied in general. Um, and we know that they're pretty bad for our health, but um, in recent years, the United States have actually been replacing these two PFAS with other types of PFAS. One concerning thing about PFAS is that once they're in the environment, so even though these are not really produced anymore, um, they're particularly challenging to remove. And when you have repeated exposures, either from your food products or through your household dust, um, they can also stick around in our bodies for a really long time. So we can be exposed for them for a really long time. One of the most prevalent ways in which we are exposed to PFAS is via our drinking water. So <clears throat> on your screen here, you see a screenshot from this map here, which I love, I think it's fascinating. 
Um, and each dot shows an area by which PFAS has been detected in drinking water specifically. You can see that some states don't have a lot of dots, and that's because these purple dots represent military sites, whereas the blue dots are actually representing some site that some other entity has measured. So the bottom line here is a lot of states aren't just really looking for PFAS, as you can see here. So if you look at the states that do do a really great job at looking for PFAS, such as North Carolina, Michigan, or New Jersey, you can see here that there's a lot of PFAS being found in drinking water across the board. If we look at what's going on in Michigan specifically on a county by county level, um, there is some differences here. So some of these counties in white have not had detection in drinking water. Um, so this is not rivers or lakes or anything else. But other counties have had some pretty high detections at up to 18,000 parts per trillion. And to put this in comparison, um, the proposed regulations from EPA are at fractions of parts per trillion, up to 2,000 parts per trillion, just depending on what type of PFAS here. Similarly, Eagle is again really low at tens of parts per trillion to hundreds of parts per trillion, much less than some of our higher exposures here. And I just want to point out that this also doesn't include, for example, some of these people's well water that might have higher levels of PFAS, especially if you're next to a contamination site, which is marked in green. Uh, it, it just includes general city or township water. So what do these PFAS actually do when they get into our bodies? Well, first of all, they're highly fat soluble, which means they get almost everywhere in our body pretty quickly. Um, and once they're there, um, they have a variety of different effects affecting a number of different organ systems. So they can change our metabolism, leading to an increased risk of diabetes, changes in our cholesterol levels, or just general alterations in our metabolism and changing our obesity risk. They can also change our hormone system, increasing our chance of thyroid disease, and also interact with our immune system, changing how we respond to different assaults and vaccines. Reproductively, we know that there are effects in maternal outcomes, including a lower chance of getting pregnant, changes in blood pressure or preeclampsia risk, which can be really severe for health outcomes in pregnant women. And then when we consider the developing infant, PFAS have also been associated with lower birth weight, decreased gestational age, um, disruption in metabolism, which can risk change the risk of childhood obesity, um, changes in the immune system development, and changes in the brain development. And one of the primary ways, if you haven't guessed by now, that we think all of these changes might be happening is not just by PFAS interacting directly with these systems, but actually changes in the epigenome itself. And accordingly, there have been a number of studies uh, that have linked PFAS exposure to developmental changes in the epigenome, specifically DNA methylation. And most of these studies have looked at what I think of as kind of that single light bulb change level of DNA methylation, looking at single gene differences in IGF-2, ALU, or MEST, as well as more so epigenome-wide single differences, um, but still at that light bulb resolution, looking at gene differences here or here, or similarly to that four to 15 region differences as by Starling, which more so approaches this, this collection of light bulb differences here. But none of these have considered differences in this whole cycle of DNA methylation. And indeed, all of the mechanisms that um, are reported in those studies that I just showed looked at how cytosine compares to the total changes in all these methylation marks because they use this technology used by sulfide conversion. And because of that, there is no differentiation between this 5MC mark and 5HMC mark, which we think is important for the actual um, interpretation of how epigenetics, epigenetics, especially DNA methylation, can be related to gene expression down the line. 
So to start to answer this question and understand the subtle differences between these two marks in an environmental epigenetic uh, and um, epidemiology study, um, we had this wonderful group of maternal uh, participants who volunteered to donate their first trimester PFAS exposures. And we collected cord blood samples from here. And we were interested in understanding how all of this can be related to the adverse birth outcomes that I was talking about earlier, such as decreased gestational exposure age and decreased birth weight via a more causation approach, looking at a mediation effect of how these individual methylation differences might be interceding in this relationship down here. To do so, um, we use the Michigan Mother Infant Pairs Cohort, or MIP. And for this cohort, moms were recruited in eight to 14 weeks in pregnancy. And we measured PFAS, a number of different PFAS in maternal blood at this time. And to show you what some of those exposures look like, you can see that PFHSX, PFOS, PFOA were pretty highly detected. PFNA and PFDA were moderately detected. And then PFUNDA and MIFASA were pretty lowly detected with a lot of different dots down here at the bottom of the box plot. And so for these, we imputed anything that was below our level of detection, as you can kind of see here, which was variable for each of the PFAS with LOD um, by square root of two. And then for the two PFAS that had really low detection, we turned those into categorical variables, either above or below that limit of detection. So these five here were kept as numeric and these were categorical. We then measured DNA methylation in cord blood using that typical bisulfite conversion, which looks at, again, that all of those different methylation marks compared to just normal cytosine. And then we use this process called oxidative bisulfite conversion, which is a clever modification of bisulfite conversion, but actually allows you to see the differences between cord blood 5MC and 5HMC separately rather than together as a single measure. From there, we had the EPIC array, which measures methylation, either total methylation or these individual level methylation at over 850,000 sites across the genome. And we took all of these data through a number of different QC processes um, and used regressions to regress individual PFAS exposure on the methylation mark of interest. So first, just really briefly, I'm gonna show you kind of what we were able to replicate given what we know already about DNA methylation and PFAS exposure. So um, we had those 850,000 sites that got down to 750, about thousand sites. And similarly to the previously reported studies, we were able to find that light bulb change. Um, we had a number of different sites for PFHFX, PFOS, PFOA, PFNAA, and PFDA. And just like I showed you earlier, there weren't that many sites within the tens that were related to total methylation. So this is the combined measure of 5MC and 5HMC. And just to show you what those look like, we have our lovely Manhattan plots over here and volcano plots over here of two of our uh, PFAS exposures. You can see that for both of these exposures, the significant differences in methylation were kind of well spread across the genome. So this is chromosomal location over here. And there were a range of significant values, which you can see on the y-axis here, that were also correlated with different uh, levels of methylation. So some were positively correlated with PFAS exposure and others were negatively correlated with PFAS exposure. Now, interestingly, when we move into the subtle differences between 5MC and 5HMC, what we found was pretty astonishing. We used similar models, um, but this time we truncated our values and decided not to include anything that was really lowly methylated because we were most interested in what was different. So we had a few 
thousand sites fewer. Um, but what we found were many more hits across our entire genome. Now, instead of looking at tens of hits, we're looking at thousands of hits by uh, each different PFAS exposure, which was remarkable and has never been reported in environmental epidemiology before. When we zoom in on these, we can see that for the most part, 5MC has hits that are increased with PFAS exposure, whereas 5-HMC has hits that are decreased with PFAS exposure. Then we can continue to zoom in on 5-HMC because what we're really interested in is how this mark, which is most correlated with gene expression over 5-MC, is different compared to our traditional results that we've viewed in environmental epidemiology. So this is a lot to look at, but um, what we're doing here is actually looking at if there are any overlaps between our either site-wise differences, so these are the light bulbs, by PFAS. So you can see um, these are both the same thing, showing comparisons across the board. And these insets are Venn diagram versions of this upsetter plot. And what's important to understand here is that we have, you know, up to 4,000 hits by PFAS, which you can see here. And um, with genes, if we zoom in on some of the ones that had the highest overlap, there were a number of genes. I think it's pretty small for you, but there are three genes specifically that overlapped in five different exposures, including Shank 2, which um, encodes for synaptic uh, structures and is related to the development of autism spectrum disorder, CARD 3, which is a cell division and growth gene, and then MyH3, which makes myosin first, that's important for cell structure and cell division. That's all well and good, and we were able to establish several key facts from this particular uh, research project. First of all, we were able to replicate what has already been understood in the literature that PFAS are related to total methylation at that single light bulb mark. But more importantly, there seem to be major differences in 5MC and 5HMC that could be contributing to these differences in how we uh, link epigenetics to adverse birth outcomes down the line. The next step was to confirm in our particular cohort the relationship between PFAS exposure and adverse birth outcomes. So as I suggested earlier, there's strong evidence that, inc that links PFAS with decreased gestational age and decreased fetal growth. So adjusting for parity, race, and smoking status, I was interested in how these all were related to our individual PFAS of exposure. And we did find with gestational age that there were two particular PFAS, PFNDA and PFNDA, that were negatively associated with gestational age. Similarly for growth, we found that there was one PFAS, PFHSX, that was negatively associated for Fenton G score, Z score, which is a, a measure that is size adjusted for gestational age and corrected for sex. So now we've succeeded to replicate what's in the literature there, what's in the literature down here. And the last thing we were really interested in is, does this relationship mediate all of these known outcomes down here by either that single gene light bulb or by the collective version of what's going on in <clears throat> the larger picture. So to do this, we filtered down our CPGs that were really significant, um, and we filtered down our PFAS that only were related to birth outcomes. And then I used a nonlinear mediation effect um, to look at gene-wise differences and which is again, that single light bulb. 
And then all significant CPG differences, which is more of that representative of multiple light bulbs all firing together, and how those mediate the relationship between PFAS and birth outcome. And so this is a little bit complicated, but you can see all the comparisons I made. So for PFHSX, uh, there were um, there was a relationship with Fenton Z score. So we compared the differences between 5MC and 5HMC. For PFNA, there was a relationship with gestational age, similar comparisons. And then for PFNDA, uh, there was a relationship with gestational age. So again, similar comparisons. So we filtered down just the number of sites that were significant within each of these already. And what we found were that there was no relationship with total methylation measures in a mediation effect, but there were significant relationships comparing that whole collection of light bulb effects and not just that single light bulb effects with birth outcome. So overall, what we found were that there are epigenetic effects that are specific to both 5-MC and 5-HMC in this light bulb effect. But more importantly, these light bulbs seem to coordinate together in a way that's also specific to this 5-MC and 5-HMC to mediate the known relationship between PFAS and adverse birth outcomes. This is remarkable, but we wanted to take it one step further. And as a toxicologist, what I'm most interested in is now understanding what the most um, possible mechanisms are for this relationship. So we had a subset of moms and infants that had markers of reactive oxidative stress, as well as measures of RNA expression. And so for what we were interested in here is are there indications that the epigenetic machinery is actually changing to change the um, DNA methylation marks down the line? Or are there measures of oxidative stress that are related to changes in uh, DNA methylation and potentially epigenetic machinery? So just really briefly, I'm gonna sh show you these results. This is an example of one of the figures I'm going to show you. This is maternal oxidative stress measures against PFOS. And what we do see is that with this particular measure of oxidative stress in the first trimester, we're seeing a significant relationship between um, maternal PFOS blood concentration and oxidative stress measures. And as we looked across the way, we saw that there were increased oxidative stress in the infant cord blood associated with PFAS, as well as the increased measure of TET3, which is an RNA expression epigenetic machinery gene associated with some PFAS as well. So a lot going on here, which seems to indicate several different things. First of all, um, we were able to replicate what's known in the literature. And, you know, there's tens of sites that are related to PFAS exposure when you consider that total methylation differences. However, when you parse apart the differences between 5-methylation, 5-MC, uh, and 5-HMC, we are now seeing hundreds to thousands of sites in opposite fashion, with 5-MC mostly increased and 5-HMC mostly decreased. We are seeing a nonlinear collective family of light bulbs related to the 5MC or 5HMC mediation that is affecting the relationship on gestational age and PFAS exposure early in life. Additionally, we're seeing oxidative reactive nitrogen stress and increased TET3 expression, primarily in infants at birth, that may be linked to this mediation effect. And so what this means for a broader audience sort of view is that not only were we able to establish a causal link from PFAS to DNA methylation to adverse birth outcomes, but we were also able to establish a hypothetical uh, reactive oxidative stress and epigenetic machinery changes that could be underlying this 
total relationship. And so <laughs> importantly, not only this, this is showing how we might be able to use the knowledge behind toxicology and, and subtle differences in basic biology to better understand this mechanism and target our assays for biomarkers of exposure or effects or possible treatments down the line, we are missing a big picture here in public health. Most environmental epidemiology um, studies that have been interested in DNA methylation use total DNA methylation. And there are major discrepancies when considering environmental toxicants such as PFAS when looking at the subtle differences between 5-MC and 5-HMC. Additionally, when we consider all of this, we need to consider how we're using statistics to better understand this. And all of these details really reflect individual lifelong relationships that regard developmental health and links to long-term health in the end. So putting all of this together is really important to understand and protect public health. And instead of just identifying the same or even different sites site by site, we need to think about how we're carefully designing studies to reflect the broader implications of what might actually be going on. So uh, with that, I think that we're about at time for questions. And um, I'd like to thank all of you, of course, for talking to me here today. And if you have any questions, please follow me at Twitter, email me. Um, of course, we'll talk a little bit more and we can you can find me here on campus. So um, I think that's about it. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Petrov. Yeah, this is really interesting uh, presentation and then uh, finding. So, uh, so um, if you have any question, please put your question to Q&A. And then uh, if you want to uh, verbally ask a question, then uh, if you just ask us and then we can uh, let you unmute and then uh, ask a question. So while you are thinking about uh, potential questions, so I have a couple of questions that we can start um, as a, so to have other people uh, think about their questions. So um, the, okay, what, so the, as you may know that, so the PFAS are like a structurally similar to like a free fatty acid. So, uh, and, I believe that fatty acid also can impact uh, this methylation, uh, DNA methylation pattern. And so the, I was wondering if, like, because of the, the structural similarity between PFAS and uh, free fatty acid, and so do you see, like, a, you show, you know, uh, many different, like, a gene and then CPG site detected in, you know, by different, uh, this, PFAS compound, but do you see some overlap of the detected is uh, the CPG side or gene between this PFAS and uh, free fatty acids? So that may help us understand how this PFAS impact this uh, DNA methylation and is it, it may be because there are structural similarities. So can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that's especially important considering differences in um, metabolism risk, as well as neurodevelopment, because we know all of those fatty acids that we produce endogenously are so important for the development of our nervous system. Um, we did do some pathway analysis on the groups of uh, sites that we had. And there were general changes, but most of them were not related to specific metabolism or like fatty acid changes. They were related more so to cell development and differentiation and things like that. Um, and so if you, I, I had the really complicated figure, but this is a, a more, um, a more simple figure of, what has been seen on the overlap. So these are our top three overlapping genes, um, looking at only 5-hydroxymethylation. So you can see that uh, all three of the genes were overlapping in 5-PFAS. And um, most of them had a negative relationship with a couple of positive ones throughout. Oh, there 
it in there. Um, but shank two specifically is a neurodevelopmental gene. And then part three and my H9 are two genes that are related to cell structure and differentiation. That's good. Okay, so it's interesting. So we have a, one question from uh, the audience. Um, uh, DNA methylation is by and large involved in gene gene repression. So is the biological function of hydroxymethylation more or less the same? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. And uh, <clears throat> what's really interesting is that the, the most prominent area in which we have learned about hydroxymethylation is in neuroscience because in the brain, hydroxymethylation and methylation are almost equal. There's almost the same number of those molecules occurring. And what neuroscientists have discovered is that hydroxymethylation in general has opposite biological effects of methylation alone. And so what it seems to do is actually reverse those typically thought of, of repressive effects and instead turn that gene back on and allow for transcription. Okay, so. Um... Maybe I want to ask you about some epidemiology questions. So if you I'll do my best. Okay. All right. So, and as you know, that so the, in epidemiology, so to make a causal inference, the major threat is confounding. And yeah. I understand that you know this okay, epigenome wide and gene genome wide association confounding adjustment is a is a big challenge. Yes. And so in this relationship, so I guess. Like a socioeconomic status or diet, diet may be an important potential confounder, uh, which I don't think were adjusted in your analysis. So, can you have some comment on? So, yeah. So yeah. we did we did um, correlation analysis before we did anything to look at potential confounders and how they could have related with things. And I also tested a, several different models with subsets of the data to make sure we were capturing the best amount of confounding that we know is associated um, in that, that relationship. Um, so we did include measures for parity, smoking, sex, and race as a proxy of racism and some socioeconomic values. Um, the other values that we had, such as like educational attainment and um, job status, First of all, they, they weren't the best measures of those, but they weren't also not very related to either outcome or um, predictor. And um, we unfortunately did not have any measures for dietary other than the number of times per week that they ate fast food, which again was not super predictive of anything. So uh, we were able to include some confounding, but of course there could always be unmeasured confounding that, uh, you know, contribute to the interpretation of our relationships and the outcomes here. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, we have another question. So how can we use this research to inform changes by community, communities, healthcare system, or policymakers? Yes, I think that those are three great and different questions. I think um, this is something that I'm really interested in and passionate about. Um, with PFAS, especially while it's been widely used and we understand that there are some health effects, there's still a lot of things that we don't know. And so, for example, when I showed the, the proposed EPA regulations, um, what EPA is trying to consider there is what are the lowest level of effects that happen after you're exposed to lifelong levels of these drinking water changes. And there's a lot of discussion, generally speaking, in the world of environmental health, is if whether or not we are measuring health effects in the, in the most significant way and how, how we can use these low level effects in policy regulation. And so the important thing that I think from this research really it takes is that um, it shows you that 
what we might be doing as researchers is not actually capturing that lowest level effect because we weren't able to see a mediation effect with this total DNA methylation measure. Instead, we only see it when we divide up that methylation and hydroxymethylation. And so as researchers, we need to consider how our research will be used by policymakers to best protect public health. Similarly, with doctors and healthcare systems, I think down the line, we will be looking at epigenetic measures for biomarkers of effects and exposure. Um, I think that's a, a ways off, but it's coming. Um, and then communities, I think, are uh, can best protect themselves um, with this particular research by understanding you know, where their exposures might be coming from and how they can advocate and protect people from these types of exposures in the best of their abilities in the long term. Okay, so actually I have a follow-up question, but uh, let me uh, read the question uh, from uh, Dr. Bhattansa uh, Padma Naban, and then maybe we can follow up. So the, the two appear to have a in yen relationship at transcription level. If so, the opposing changes you see can they cancel each other out at gene transcription level? How would you partition, partition that out? Yeah, I think it would be important to look at gene-wise comparisons and to see if these hits are at similar sites. But I can tell you from looking at these data kind of similar uh, uh, at a larger effect that um, most of the sites that you saw that were really different were not at the same CPG. So it may or may not have been contributing in that yin yang effect in that same gene to kind of have a net zero effect as, as I think you're kind of um, um, suggesting there. Um, the other, I think, important thing here to consider is that 5-methylation is much more studied. And with that, we've come to learn that while canonically we think that 5MC has gene repression effects, what we actually see is that it really depends on where that mark is occurring in the genome. Whereas what we've seen with 5HMC so far is it's actually much more correlated with gene expression. So it might be a better indicator of gene transcription down the line than 5MC alone. So I think there's this is really exciting and we have a lot to discover here as you suggest, um, but we definitely need more work with both the basic biology part as well as you know understanding what this means for broader populations as well. Good. Okay. So, um, uh, okay. So I don't see any other questions. So then maybe I can ask one more question. Um, so the interesting finding from your presentation I, I found was that, so the, this population also showed that, so the P4, P4, P4s and uh, PFH access are relatively higher, which are consistent with the other population, uh, but the PF, like a, uh, on DECA, DECA, so those exposure level relatively lower, uh, but your association with methylation, so you see more finding in that uh, like a low detected uh, compound. So uh, do you have any insights of why you, so in your analysis, why those more like less detected compound have a more, more signal than compared to the known like a legacy compounds? Yeah, I would, so I would say that, I can share my screen again here. Um, so the PFDA definitely surprised me, I would say. I did not expect to see that this would be the one with the, the greatest number of hits. I would say with most other ones, they're kind of in the same ballpark area. Um, but it is interesting and suggests to me that while we have spent a lot of focus on the PFOS and PFOA, it's perhaps that these ones are not the most epigenetically toxic. Um, and instead, 
maybe they are acting more to interact directly with our fatty acids or through a different mechanism. Whereas there are maybe other chemicals with slightly different structures that have more of a uh, environmental challenge and assault on our epigenome here. Mm. So then I think this is a, because if you see, so that there is a, some pattern, so it looks like the longer chain have a more signal, even though the more signal doesn't necessarily mean that more toxicity, right? Yeah. But uh, how this methylation and then the, the length of the this PFAS compound is related. So this may not be tested in human study, but uh, it would be interesting to design on uh, like an animal study or experimental study to test how this uh, different length of compound can impact mm -hmm. the methylation uh, at the like a gene level. So. Yeah, and I also want to point out, like in general, we think kind of longer chain is worse. Um, and when we looked at our actual birth outcomes too, the two most significant relationships were with gestational age, and they was, were only related to the PFNDA and PFNDA. So there's definitely some indication of that in these data, but more research would be very helpful. Great. Okay. So, oops, this is four fifty-three. So we have to end this meeting. So thank you for yeah, thank you for your presentation, and then uh, all the audience. So thank you for attending this uh, meeting. So uh, this is the end of our environmental research seminar series this year. So we will uh, see you again uh, in the new year next year. So uh, have a wonderful holiday, December end of the year season, and then we will see you uh, in the new year. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you all.